for most of us, our introduction to Shakespeare is words on a page. In this edition of Shakespeare on Stage, we're going to discuss the language of Shakespeare. Shakespeare's use of the English language has been praised as powerful, beautiful, and effective. And many of Shakespeare's phrases have become part of our language today, even though they were written 400 years ago. When we first open the pages of a Shakespearean text, the beauty and power of the speech may be obscured by the unfamiliar words and constructions of 16th century English. We must find our way past these barriers to discover the poetry that awaits us there. And we must remember that when Shakespeare wrote, he was hearing his words spoken on the stage. He was creating a flow of sound and meaning that could caress us, terrify us, or thrill us. The vowels and consonants of the English language became a great river of sound that sometimes flowed majestically and serenely and sometimes thundered through rapids full of storm and fury. However difficult we may find the text on first reading, we can be certain that the struggle to break through to the poetry will be worth the effort. No finer language has ever been written. Now, let's examine some techniques that will help us find our way into Shakespeare's language. Kathleen, you're an actress, you're a teacher of acting students, you've directed Shakespeare. Do you have any advice for those people who are reading Shakespeare for the first time or attending Shakespeare for the first time as it relates to the language? Over the years, I have come up with things that I could say are our advice for either reading a Shakespeare play or going to see one. I think that if you're going to see a production, what's really important is that you prepare yourself within those minutes before reading the program. It seems very simple, but it, it's very true to read the programs so that you're familiar with names. The names sound peculiar. They're not, it's not John and Mary in these productions. Um, it takes about 10 minutes or so to allow your ear to get used to the fact that people are talking in longer sentences than we normally do. Um, there are other words, other, uh, other vocabulary that the characters are using that we may not be used to and least we need to allow that ear to take time to adjust to it it's like listening to any dialect that we may not know at first once we steep ourselves in it for a few minutes we get used to it the rhythm of it all begins to carry us in reading the plays most of the time I just suggest that that people keep track of all the people who are on that stage in the mind's eye as it were while you're reading the plays themselves and to keep track of who the characters are here's a typical text page it gives us the names of the characters and the words there to speak in this case, we have a dialogue, two or more people speaking to each other. Sometimes only one character will speak. This is called a monologue or a soliloquy if he speaks directly to the audience. Sometimes there are stage directions, although Shakespeare's original scripts had virtually no directions. The language told us all we needed to know about what was happening on stage. At first, Shakespeare's language may be hard to listen to. Although it uses the rhythms of ordinary speech, it's not ordinary. It uses words and images that are elevated, poetic extensions of ordinary speech. But if we relax and allow the language to happen to us, we can understand what is occurring on stage, even if we do not know the meaning of all the words. Each play has a number of different characters, many of whom have unusual names, which may confuse us. Seeing the play on stage diminishes this problem because we associate the characteristics of the actor with each character. When reading the play, it is often helpful to use an addition that gives a synopsis of the plot. But the synopsis is not the play. The meaning of Shakespeare's work is not in what happens, but in the wonderful blend of emotion and insight revealed in the interaction between the characters. And, of course, the language. The upper-class characters in Shakespeare's plays usually speak in a verse form called iambic pentameter. Iambic means that there is one stressed syllable followed by an unstressed syllable, as in this example. It is the cause, it is the cause, my soul. The underlined word being the stressed syllable. Pentameter means there are five beats to the line of verse. It is the cause, it is the cause, my soul. The accented words being the beat. On the page, the words and punctuation suggest powerful emotion. The flow of words is broken up, phrases are repeated. These are hints to the actor about how the words should be read aloud. Now, let's listen to the poetry in this speech by Othello. 
taunted by Iago's insinuations that his new bride, Desdemona, is unfaithful to him, Othello decides he has to murder her. He enters her bedchamber and says these words. It is the cause. It is the cause, my soul. Let me not name it to you, you chase stars. It is the cause. It have not shed her blood, nor scar that whiter skin of hers than snow, and smooth as monumental alabaster. Yet she must die, else she'll betray more men. Put out the light, and then put out the light. If I quench thee, thou flaming minister, I can again thy former light restore, should I repent thee. But once put out thy light, thou cunningst pattern of excelling nature, I know not where is that Promethean heat that can again thy former light relume. When I have plucked the rose, I cannot give it vital growth again. It needs must wither. I'll smell it on the tree. The language is different, but as we've just seen, it's poetic, rich, and colorful. Modern actors playing Shakespearean texts find the language difficult as well. It takes hours of rehearsal to master the special problems encountered. I have extraordinary difficulty with the language of Shakespearean plays. I've been acting them for about a third of my life. I've been teaching Shakespearean text for about six years. And I find that both for my students and for myself, it takes a great deal of preparation, sometimes with dictionaries, sometimes with um, reference books, um, sometimes with recordings to get used to the sound, to get used to the rhythm of it all. It is difficult. It takes time. But the rewards are incredible because of the, the, just the richness of the language and the incre incredible sense of mastery that you get when you have finished that work. Yeah, you, you really have to work at it uh, diligently in order to really get a sense of what's happening in the scenes. You also have to work with the director on the language to try to get it right, to understand what's happening between the characters in a particular scene, uh, to make sure that you're both playing the same things, uh, so that there's not a, there's not a kind of a cross purposes going on. The difficulty in working with Shakespearean language is something that I don't think anybody ever really solves except in the rehearsal of it. Um, I find that even when I go to the theater as an audience member, that it takes me a while to get my ear used to the length of the sentences, to get used to the odd sounding names, to get used to um, just the rhythms that carry the language. During rehearsal, the director makes sure the actors use the language to get the action right and show the audience as well as tell them what's happening. For example, in Act 3, Scene 3, Iago and Othello are talking to each other. Ralph Lane, the director, had a particular point he wanted to show in this scene using the language. Excellent wretch! Perdition catch my soul, but I do love thee. And when I love thee not, Chaos is come again. My noble lord, what dost thou say, Iago? Did Michael Cassio, when you wooed my lady, know of your love? He did, from first to last. Why dost thou ask? But for a satisfaction of my thought, no further harm. Why of thy thought, Iago? I did not think he had been acquainted with her. Oh, yes, and went between us very often. Indeed. Indeed? I indeed. You saying as thou art in that? Okay, cut. Okay, let's talk about this for just a second from the standpoint of what we want to do with this scene. And I stopped you now because it seems to me the indeeds are a good place to do it. Remember, we talked before about wanting this scene to counterbalance the one that's gone just before it. It's the one that we're going to turn. We're going to lead up to the intermission for our show here. And we want this to be the masculine counterbalance of the female male kind of game playing that took place between you and Desdemona just before. OK, the kind of game playing that was masculine at this time, remember, we talked 
talked about before in terms of the Socratic dialogue, the business of the wit, the way people show their inventiveness. You've had the scene where you did the poetic inventiveness. Now this is one in terms of a rhetorical, logical, reasoning kind of inventiveness. But it seems to me when he says indeed, then you can say indeed, and we take it from there. And you start leading him on in terms of the Socratic dialogue method, and you think you're leading him on, but in reality, finally, when you get him to the point that he has logically reasoned it all out, and then you say, good, I'm glad you feel this way, and we have had the lightness of the scene, but we lead us to the point then that you can say, look to your wife. And at that point, what has been simply a clever wit game becomes a serious kind of thing, and it makes the impact very heavy on you then. Okay, see? So can we try it again? Let's see what happens? Okay, good. The words on the page can spark our imagination as we read the play. These same words are the clues an actor must use for what he or she must do on the stage. And as an actress, it's a great personal task to really get those words to come alive. But there are ways to make that happen. And we have to learn constantly different kinds of techniques to make the, the words come alive for us as we speak them. Let me give you an example of Amelia's from the play. This is a speech that takes place in Act 5, Scene 2. I'd like to read it for you. What did thy song bode, lady? Hark, canst thou hear me? I will play the swan and die in music. Willow, willow, willow. More she was chaste. She loved thee, cruel moor. So come my soul to bliss as I speak true. So speaking as I think, I die, I die. When we read the speech, we get an idea that obviously these are Amelia's final words before she dies. Um, the poetry is relatively simple, some very beautiful sounds, some sounds that repeat throughout the um, speech that give a nice lyric quality to it. For the actress, there's a lot more that those words begin to, um, to infer, imply. And what's really crucial, I think, are the fact that the phrases themselves, the lengths of the phrases, tell me, first of all, how much breath I need. They tell me when to take a breath. They tell me how much time I have in which to make a movement. They tell me who I'm looking at. They clarify the eye focus for me. It also clarifies what the key idea or the key action is for me in this speech, which is the fact that I die, literally, within the play. And it's repeated with the words, I die, I die. There also is the significance that Amelia sings in this speech. When she repeats the words, willow, 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 we read them. The actress, however, has to sing them. It's a song she's repeating back to Desdemona. So if we expend a little effort, we can find our way past the surface barriers into the deep river of language that is at the heart of Shakespeare's drama. If we find the sound as well as the sight of Shakespeare's words, we can enjoy the power and the beauty of one of the world's greatest poets. What did thy song bode, lady? Ark, canst thou hear me? I will play the swan and die in music. Willow, willow, willow. More, she was chaste. She loved thee, cruel Moor. So come my soul to bliss as I speak true. So speaking as I think, I die. I die. Thank you. 